This is Scott Woods from rockcritics.com. It's January 11th, 2010, and this is episode 7 of my conversation with Bob Dobbs. Bob, it's been a while. How are you doing? Yes, I'm okay. Happy New Year, and uh, I hope we haven't had too much of a gap. Let's yeah. try to get tuned into the January of the new decade. Okay, good. Well, I've, I wanted to um, dive right in. I've got um, one one sort of broad topic that I'm thinking of this week, and uh, you know, a couple of quotes I'll throw at you. Um, it's bas- basically the topic is noise, something that rock critics, um, you know, like to like to go off about um, quite frequently. And I want to sort of discuss the relevance of noise among other things. But I'm going to start with um, there's there's two actually very recent books out at the, at the moment by somewhat rock critics. One is called um, The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century. That's by a guy named Alex Ross, and he's, I believe, a New Yorker. And then there's a British book by a guy named David Stubbs called Fear of Music, Why People Get Rothko But Don't Get Stockhausen. And so both of these books, I haven't uh, read the Stubbs. I have read most of the Alex Ross book. But both of them obviously deal with uh, early 20th century you know, modernist composers um, of the Stockhausen, uh, Schoenberg, Stravinsky lineage. And I guess the question I want to ask you is sort of taking off from the subtitle of the David Stubbs book, the Why People Get Rothko But Don't Get Stockhausen. So I guess let's just look at that. Why, why are painters, for instance, like Picasso or Kandinsky or Rothko, why do you think they're uh, retroactively hailed as geniuses for altering perceptions through their visual art with works that were at the time, I think, considered uh, extremely difficult or even violent to the senses, while the mass um, audience or mass ears still have a really difficult time uh, tuning into music by people like Schoenberg and you know Edgar Varese? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, Verez or Verez, and uh, certainly Stockhausen. Why, why can we, why can we embrace uh, difficult visual art much easier than we can uh, difficult um, oral art? I'm reminded of something McLuhan said in the late '60s about the Smothers Brothers show. He, he they got canceled in '69 or so. And I think it was because of some comments on the Vietnam War. Not sure. But that sounds right, yeah. Yeah, and McLuhan wrote a letter to Playboy trying to explain it. He said, um, you can make jokes about sex now because sex is dead, but you can't make jokes about Vietnam because that's a living, iconic expression of the tensions of the present. And so I, I think of that in response to this, um, of what you brought up. And uh, synchronistically, in my last show talking with Ben Watson, Ben out of the blue made this statement, and this was uh, show number 34 if you want to look it up, uh, in the Bob and Ben series. Ben says, Zappa turned the possibility of music into a criticism of how everything else was going. He had this window in the 60s when music was privileged. In the 20s and 30s, visual art was privileged. It was the thing. In the 60s, music was the thing. Then Ben says, at the moment, I don't know what is the thing, but I think we're on to it, meaning me and Ben. So I immediately jump in and say, it's tactility, Ben. Tactility is what it is. And that's ESP and the simulation of ESP. So my point is, is that people get Rothko now because the eye doesn't matter. But music does matter. Music is the drug for the, ho- the global hologram. M- remember, I've talked about music being a private concern. It's like music is the Vietnam. It's your identity so much. People need the drug of music to release themselves from the ground of tactile massage that's going on. And so, therefore, the uh, visual arts, which at the time Rothko was happening, wasn't popular. Uh, but we can review the history of visual art, and it's, it's uh, like water off the duck of a, the back of a duck. It's not, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's the, it's the same syndrome of sex. It's dead. It doesn't matter what happens with it. It doesn't, it doesn't stress people 
people's identity. But people's identity is involved with the TV landscape and their TV body, which includes music. Music is really the core of it. And that's important. That's the Vietnam. So, uh, but now music was the thing 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago. And Ben says, what is it now? And I say, it's tactility. And tactility is this uh, dancing to architecture and synesthesia that we've been talking about. Right. That is what releases people today. And so what is the ground of tactility? That's another level I would like to get to at some point. So when, music, when electric orality came in with radio 80 years ago, then... As Ben says, in the 20s and 30s, visual art was privileged. Everybody was concerned about the quality of the eye and what decorated their walls or their culture mausoleums known as uh, museums. Uh, this was important. What was happening to the eyes, everybody was fixated on. And when they're fixated on, on something, they're obsessed and have a need for it to balance some underlying tension. So when radio moved us into electric morality and jazz and music and all that came in with radio, people in the West, being visually conditioned, became obsessed with the eye. And so that would be their private concern, right? So, so that is why Ben is correct uh, to cite the cliche that in the 20s and 30s visual art was privileged. It was the thing. It was what people were neurotic about. Okay, they, they just couldn't handle the changes that were happening to the eye, and those changes in the arts by Picasso and, and Lewis and everybody uh, were symptoms of a change in the whole sensory ratios of the people. Okay, so then you come into the 60s, and Ben says music was the thing. That's because in the global hologram of the 60s, it was a tactile culture. That was the hidden ground, the, the extension of tactility. But, but the eye would not be something that would bounce off and give a release from tactile massage. It would have to be the ear. So the ear became the essence of private concern and the obsessive compulsive disorder about uh, the quality of music and what was happening to it. And so those that, uh, that liked the new youth music uh, were irritating to the adults who were either hoping some interest in, uh, in uh, Verez or Boulez or the serious composers, or wanted to go back to the symphonies, and Leonard Bernstein would fill that gap, or they go to the Boston Pops. You have this issue, and uh, so when you say people never got Rothko, no, I mean never got uh, Stockhausen that, it's because music is more important to people's lives than visual art. That would be my broad ex explanation of why people now can understand Picasso, because the, the techniques of Picasso and the Surrealists and the Dadis and everybody else brought in 80 years ago are normal fare in advertising by the 50s, or at least right. the 60s. So the eye is, is not an issue of concern. And so people can get it, can claim they understand Picasso and, and Rothko. If they actually heard my explanation of why they were getting it and, and the details or issues of what the artists were saying, if you read their own criticism, their own critical theory, they wouldn't understand that. All right? Maybe a few educated people in the humanities that go into the fine arts departments or something, they would understand it. And you see them, when I was in New York, you saw these young people being experts on the history of art uh, all over the place. And they were trying to get jobs in museums. So they would guide the tours through the Met and the Guggenheim, the Whitney and the Frick and all that, right? These, these, yeah. these young whippersnappers, and um, they toss it off. But, you know, as soon as they left the museum, they'd put their little earplugs in and be listening to music, right? Right, right. Anyways, uh, um, so the eye, so this, these books are missing the larger effects, and this is consistent with my criticism that anybody doing musical theory or pop criticism, like these guys that got to the level of being an author and wrote these books, they're missing the big picture to explain it. I mean, it's a puny issue when you understand it in my terms. But what's interesting now is that in this decade, rock criticism has apparently uh, transitioned, died, because music is not the thing anymore, the way it was in the 60s and 70s. 
what now is tactility. And what is tactility? It's virtual tactility, expressing yourself in many media. You're actually expressing your synesthetic uh, sensibilities. And that is what holds people now. Just as music held people in the, in the 60s and visual art held people in the 20s and 30s. Tactility is what's um, holding people. And uh, it's hard to explain what tactility is, but the simple thing is mixed media. Everybody right. plays with mixed media with all those sensibilities. And the interplay of the senses you described it as. Yeah, it's not a sense, it's the interplay. And, and Web 2.0 allowed everybody to um, express their synesthesia in their consumption habits and their web pages and MySpaces and YouTubes and all that, right? They were able to broadcast. Yeah. We're at an interesting um, situation now where that is faltering. People are now looking for something new. And uh, what would, what would, that means the, um, the, what was the ground when tactility was a figure over the last 15 years? Now, if we figure out what that ground is, what is it as figure? And what would be the ground for that? So uh, I don't want to deal with that yet. I want to go back to, to this point that people, because music was a drug, it had to be sweet. And noise music, at least in the 1560s when uh, serial music was trying to get attention and, and people complained, I mean, we know that Zappa, as a young man, had to deal with the kind of music he wrote. He was interested in the Faber and these people and wrote music like that, but he knew it wouldn't sell. But then how do you explain how irritating music or uh, the craft work genre, the noise stuff, kind of becomes popular by the 90s, right? Right. But see, that's a different generation. And here's the key, the, the key to that. What is... Tactile music, it's noise, because tactility is the noise, um, how, the interplay of everything, but not anything in particular. Therefore, it's a blur. Acoustically, that would be noise. And so, and Ben Watson uh, just wrote an article for a noise collection. Did you see that? Did you see no, the article no. I sent around? Um, ben. Uh, he reviewed the book of all these guys writing about noise, and he, he didn't like the trendiness of noise. But, but Ben doesn't like the trendiness, but he never knows. He just feels it. He's got the right pulse. He knows there's something amiss here. It's not really a, a useful anti-environment anymore, noise, as, as right, entertainment. Right. And, he, and he can't figure out what it is, but I always come in with a larger framework and an explanation that fascinates him because even though he may not totally understand it, he says, well, at least Bob has some pretend to have an explanation about this and it's systematic once you follow what I'm doing and, and, and when Ben went through this cycle it was, a, it was such a present, a gift for me because uh, to point out that the eye was privileged in the 30s and the ear was privileged in the 60s what is privileged now? Tactility and noise is the tactile it is the tactile ear just like uh, abstract art was the tactile eye it was a noisy eye that art moved into with Rothko and them. They had their theories and their mathematics and their uh, uh, aestheticism of colors. You know, the Barnett and Newman and these guys would, uh, would float. But still, it was uh, pretty chaotic looking, pretty noisy for the eye when people saw that art in the 50s and 60s. To just think of Jackson Pollock. So noise takes over as an expression of... 20 years after the music is a thing in the 60s, what's next? Tactility. And you can start to track it in the 80s and 90s with the youth culture getting into craft work into the noise. That's the tactile ear. So that's my, uh, my immediate response to that. Okay. I'm confused by the tactile ear, but that's... Um... Okay, here's a quote from McLuhan that might help. Darkness is to space what silence is to sound i.e. the interval. So the silence right. is the interval in the sound world. So everything is noise and the, in the interval is... The interval is, is tactility. No, you have okay. to understand the... So when he says darkness, and he said this in the 60s, darkness is the space, that's like visual space, lit space. Yeah. Darkness is the space, what silence is the sound. They are both the interval or the tactile. See, the interval is not anything in particular. It's the space between things, or it's... Right, Do you right. see what I'm saying? So another word for tactility is the interval. 
And so darkness and silence are uh, tactile, but silence is, as McLuhan would uh, quote John Cage, all sounds happening at once. So another version of that is uh, noise. What was the Velvet Underground thing? White noise? Right, right. Well, white light, white heat, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so white noise is another expression of the tactile interval. And um, does that clarify anything? I think so. Um, okay, so, I mean, noise, okay, I guess I'm talking a little bit, though, about quote-unquote noise. Noise as noise as a genre, almost. I mean, you were talking about the book. Yeah, as an, as an aesthetic, aesthetic preference. Right, as an aesthetic. So noise itself, I mean, for many, many years now has... Um, you know, been so assimilated into pop music, I guess. Like, and, and you know, even s stuff on the radio. I mean, you turn on, um, you know, an R&B or a hip-hop station, and you will hear some, like, jarring sounds that, you know, 30, 40 years ago would not have been considered part of, certainly not part of pop music. Right. Like, you, can, you can hear stuff that's going on in hip-hop that... You know, it might sound almost as radical, like to some people now, as a Stockhausen would have sounded 40 years ago or something. But it's but it's more like it's been assimilated, I guess. It's not the thing in and of itself. But this is, is, there, this, is, is this, this is ammunition uh, to prove my point. But go ahead. Is there anything such? What were you going to say? Well, is is like, is there such a thing as noise in and of itself? I guess is what I'm ultimately asking. Like, is does noise actually exist anymore or is because it's it's all noise you know it's, it's, there's no such thing I mean it, it doesn't sound like no, like what function can a quote unquote noise actually serve well if we live in a post information society which is what I claim and information is you know visual acoustic proprioceptive tactile smell kinetic input or stimulation if we are so numb, then none of that registers because it's limited to the chemical body. And as we moved into the TV body, the chip body, the closest the chemical body could come to that would be the tactile interval. And for the ear, that would be noise. That's like a, a, a Pollock painting. That's noise for the eye. So the, when you think of uh, the tactile interval and synesthesia as a blur, either visually or acoustically, that is really not what tactile is. That's the closest you can visualize it or express it, but it's not. So over the last 20 years, the abrupt sounds, the abrupt noises that comes into pop music is um, more and more injecting of stimulus in a, pop, in a chemical body, in a chemical ear that's dead, that's numb, right. and is not. You see, it's very interesting how people live today. They... I mean, a friend of mine was telling me their son does something like 13,000 text messages a month. Okay? 13,000. Some huge number like that. Yeah, yeah. That, you could call that... A day or something. Yeah. It, that is moving his thumbs, I'm assuming, and it is visual noise. It's alphabetic noise that's going back and forth. But it's not acoustic noise, it's visual noise. Texting is noise, and it's a phatic, P-H-A-T-I-C, noise. Yeah. The thing is, is that we can't register what's going on in people's multi-bodies now, and therefore the extremes of the chemical body experience are the closest to approximate communication with the sensibilities of the TV body and chip body, and that would be why all the experiments of res and the noise guys of the first half of the 20th century are nothing compared to what people do and put in pop music. Like Wait, the, say that again, Bob. Say that, go, go back just a bit. What was that last sentence? The, all the, the experiments of res and the ones who uh, laid down the noise aesthetic were bringing in the sounds of the environment that Cage yeah. was like the PR poster child for. Yeah. That stuff is so puny compared to the sounds that the average kids make in their hip hop records or whatever, wherever they do it. Uh, their websites, their MySpace, they make collages. It's, it's, 
the closest you can come to stimulating the TV ear and the chip body ear is to have some blatant, extreme attack. <laughs> and you can call it noise. So the aesthetic of noise is faded out. And so, so when Ben says, um, at the moment, I don't know what is the thing, but I think we're on to it. And I'm telling Ben it's tactility. I would have said that 20 years ago. Tactility was the next area of private concern, and we are past that because you can't describe the sensibilities of where we are for the kid who doesn't care, is not stimulated by the noise anymore. Right. So noise becomes sweet in the pop music, in the pop market. Right. You know that phrase, sweet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, it is interesting. Uh, when you catch, when I catch glimpses of what's going on in the pop culture and music, it is way beyond Zappa's lovey, lumpy gravy. It's very inventive. It's just mass hallucination and stimul. Um, what was it? Uh, it's like someone said that by the early '90s, as TV became obsolete, it would have to take its clothes off. Well, music industry had to do the same thing. They had to market any kind of sound. And actually, the, the weirder or more esoteric or strange, the better. But, you, but they, felt they put the sweetness in there, too, right? Right. It's a little right. bit of sweetness, but it's, a, it's an actual, the whole range of high, low, ugly, beautiful, all constantly as a daily diet for the chemical body ear. And that is the figure, and it isn't releasing people. That's why music... You know, the music industry in a lot of ways died. Now music is dancing with architecture on your website, expressing yourself. Okay. And not, and not being, not being um, uh, concerned about actually which data you use. It's the act of typing is the thing now. So, so uh, in the 60s, music was the thing, and then Ben says, I don't know what the thing is, but I think we're on to it. It's not... Um, I don't know why uh, I, may, I don't know why Ben thinks he and I are on to it, but Ben has to recognize that tactility uh, was the uh, aesthetic preference in the '90s, and now it's just typing, <laughs> which is like tactile. Use your fingers, but it's more than that. It's like it's like producing your own universe is the thing now, and that releases you from the mystery landscape that we've moved into. So again, I brought way beyond the rock critic zone, but uh, we are, we are, we do have to deal with the fact that rock criticism disappeared. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But so, so noise is is um, noise is easier to to appreciate. Or noise is not noise because it's not it's not noise. Yeah, there was uh, uh, somebody once said in a McLuhan seminar, "How can you do theater?" if we live in a global theater. Everything is already theater inside the satellite, so what happens to the institution or genre of cultural activity called theater? Well, when everything is, when everybody's deaf, or the chemical body is deaf because you're now using your chip body ears, then what is the role of sound or music? How could it be when everything is already, what's the role of noise when everybody is already deaf? So, You'd have to get close to extreme noise to uh, prompt the uh, death. In other words, I'm saying that the most extreme situation is where we arrived at. That's what Baudrillard said he was doing, describing extreme phenomena. We, we, we're in a very extreme situation. And so these guys who write these books about why, is, uh, people, uh, why are people getting uh, Picasso and not... Um, uh, Stockhausen. Yeah. Those writers are concerned about the chemical body ear, and that died 30 years ago. That's what's sort of uh, irrelevant about that theory, about the, the concern. Okay. I but mean, I mean, there's still there, there's, I mean, there's still some truth to that, though. If you look, if if you if you take that question on its face. And you're still say that's a chemical body thing. But yeah. If you, if you take that question on its face, I mean, it's the, the, the fact of the matter is, if I were to play, um, you know, ten people in a room, if I if I put on some Stockhausen at a party, unless it was a very arty New York crowd or something, um, you know, most people would still say 
take you know take that shit off or something. If I if I try to DJ a wedding and put on Stockhausen, it just it, you know it'd be more uh, okay. Fun. So you have to look at the nature of the audiences and which one you're dealing with. But right. a part, a big part of the people today is they got no attention span. Stockhausen is trying to make a point with noise. <laughs> That's irritating. He's going to make a, almost a theoretical, linear, humanistic uh, statement with the noise. And who's got the 20 minutes to listen to it? Nobody. But we can get little, you know, little increments of sound in a two-minute song uh, when it weaves in and out every uh, five seconds or something. Right, when it's assimilated. Yeah. You actually, you're asking... Uh, when people in, if you DJ Stockhausen, you're asking people to listen to music. That's not what music for is for. Once you have a you know a wedding or a DJ environment, music is for is a supplement to the dancing, or to the drinking, or the conversation, or the flirting, or what all they, or the drug taking. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. It is not. Um, it's you're almost not, you're like not playing so people will sit there and listen. Yeah, you can, and that's a visual perspective, sitting in a chair and listening. That's why the symphonies went dead, why concert going died, and the only way people would go to a concert if some bizarre thing was happening. Like living theater in the late 60s, they, they forced the audience to come up and take their clothes off. That was the last gasp of theater. Right. right? You had to create a happening, a scene. And uh, now... Uh, music is not a issue of private concern. It's not an issue anymore of private concern. And that's part why rock criticism would die, because rock critic was the arbiter, the curators of the Museum of Acoustic Consumption for an audience that was concerned about music. Now, you're going to get the odd... Now, what's interesting, you've got a lot of immigrants coming into North America from third world cult cultures and less virtualized cultures, at least over the last 20 years, those people, those kids are going to prop up all the old arts because that's still relevant to them. Their sensibilities have not been mutated, like the kids who grew up here and whose parents grew up here. You, you follow what I'm saying here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, who, um, who, who are the popular singers today? Aren't they people with non-waspish names in, in teen music? Um, well, I mean, I think it, it's a it's a huge. Uh, that of different types of Yeah, you can't even have a standard. So, yeah, we yeah, have, yeah. I mean, maybe Britney Spears. It, there always seems to be some wasp that... that yeah, gets, there's Britney Spears and Lady Gaga. Although even Lady Gaga is like Italian-American, whatever. But yeah, right. No, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. But I'm saying... No, you've always, you've always, like in the last... Here's an example. Like in the last 10, 15 years in particular, there's definitely been a, sort of an explosion, for instance, of Latin music in, in pop music. Right, and... And the, the point is is that the audience for the archetypes of the American Hollywood entertainment complex <laughs> yep. is charismatic for um, those people who didn't experience the last 30 years and are just experiencing now as immigrants. They want to have the American hologram. So, so that's another factor. I mean, what are wealthy kids or uh, wasps suburban kids today whose parents uh, were boomers and grew up in America or Canada and then their parents did that and goes back you know 100 years or something what are they into they're into going to college and getting drunk yeah do you know about that phenomenon that they, that that all the universities now they they uh, 60 minutes a friend told me about this i didn't see it they did a special on it recently and uh the kids, it's normal to go for five days drunk. That's what you do in university now. That, now, you know, that's exploring your numbness. You know what I mean? That's, it's in, aesthetically, it's like jackass stuff. Yeah. It's reverse jackass stuff. That is what is in, in meaningful to, to people who are not immigrants, who are, who are, to people who aren't immigrants and are not trying to fit in. They already run this place. You know, remember in the movie The Good Shepherd, did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Well, the uh, mafia guy is talking to the James Jesus Angleton guy, and he says, you know, the blacks have their music, uh, the Irish have their something, and uh, us Italians, we have the church. What have you guys got? 
he says to the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant James Jesus Angleton guy, right? The head of the CIA, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or head of covert intelligence. And he says, we have the USI. We have the USA. You're all just visitors. <laughs> okay, that mentality, which is what you call the class system or the racism and all that, that's still there in, uh, in the upper white sections, right? Right. And so what are they doing? They got nowhere to go. <laughs> so they blast themselves and get drunk for five days. <laughs> that's, their, that's their private concern, to explore their proprioceptive sense. Their balance. They're exploring proprioceptive balance. Now, Scott, I'm getting an insight here. I like it when I get an insight. I've got a new pattern here. <laughs> like jackass has explored the chemical body's proprioception by just pushing it to extreme and, and hurting it upsetting their pain threshold or whatever all that extreme and bungee jumping and all that okay yeah yeah now that the chemical body is so removed people now blast their tv body scenario and that's proprioceptive uh, haptic close to tactile but there that's not a sense so the closest is proprioceptive so the drinking is it's blasting your chemical your tv body's uh, nervous system okay, that, okay so Where's music there? They're probably got, they have music on while they're doing it. Okay, another thing is, another thing is, what are these kids doing? They're, they're filming themselves and putting themselves in porn sites. You go to any porn site, there's all kinds of footage of college couples screwing, and they just put it out there on the, on the web. So where's culture there? They're not concerned about music. <laughs> they're exploring the most intimate physical processes. Is that tactility? That's tactility. That's trying to get get in touch with the most intimate part of your insides, <laughs> okay? And, and that's what proprioceptive is. That's the sense of balance and the sense of gauging how you feel inside, right? Okay. So, as a matter of fact, Eric McLuhan um, said that the Internet was, and he wrote this in the late 90s in his book called Electric Language, and uh, he says the Internet is uh, an extension of proprioception. Huh. And, and so... Um, you then, so that would be the chip body, so the anti-environment to that is uh, blowing up your chemical body's proprioception, <laughs> like getting drunk. Now, do you, do you realize, you know a bit about that fad that's happening now, that these kids... I, no, I've never, I've never heard of that, no. Yeah, they, uh, I, I think it's some university in Pennsylvania, Penn State maybe, is the, is the top drinking university. They go for weeks. Wow. <laughs> Everybody just blasts it out. In the, I, I think my friend said that the alma mater people of Penn State or some university around that area, they come to the games, you know, the ones who've been students and now are businessmen or whatever and uh, functioning or stable citizens, they come to the parking lot outside the big stadium and meet with all the undergrads and the frat boys, and they have a colossal binge of drinking for a couple of days. <laughs> now, now, I mean, just go back to the, uh, the 100 years ago, how people, uh, their sense of decency, they would not be allowed to do that. Okay, so you've got to bring in the four-body model to understand any of these issues of pop culture that, that, and, and what's happening in music. The, that's the only way to look at this, because it's be. You know, the, these books you're writing about people worried about... Is, is a 20-year-old who's blasting themselves on alcohol probably even takes art courses, fine art courses, and reads about <laughs> Picasso and Duchamp and all that because they have to write papers on it? They don't take that seriously as part of their living uh, involvement in the now. they they, they got to blast themselves around the football game. So the worried about whether someone re likes Stockhausen or not You've got to use sensory, cultural, multi-bodied reasons, not any aesthetic thing that those books probably use, right? You know what I mean? They, yeah, yeah. They, they, there ain't no art. There ain't nothing on that level anymore. As a matter of fact, the only people who are worried about art on that level are the millionaires and billionaires in New York City who have to go to the Met annual party, the Vogue uh, thing they put on, you know, the... Um, you remember the movie... The Devil Wears Prada. Right, yeah. Okay, that was based on Anna Wintour, I think, the head of Vogue right. magazine. And the whole media swarmed around the big night when they went to the Metropolitan Museum and everybody was all decked out and this was important to be seen thing. Uh, that kind of, as McLuhan said, society becomes an art form. 
high society. And we just had uh, one of them just died the other day, Casey Johnson. Have you heard of that? Uh, yeah, that's right. I did hear about that, yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, um, and this is part of my musical life. Uh, there is um, a, a site called uh, New York Social Diary and another one called Park Avenue. So occasionally I'll go there and they'll show all these young billionaire daughters uh, at their parties, at their charity balls and charity this and charity that. So when I heard about Casey Johnson, only because I had to look at TMZ and someone named Tequila Tila freaked out this weekend. <laughs> I didn't even know who it was. So I had to Google who the hell is this girl that they're harassing. And she was the lesbian lover of Casey Johnson who had just died, right? Right, right. And, and so I said, oh, Casey Johnson. So let's, uh, let's see if I ever noticed her on this New York Social Diary. And I click on it, and I put in Casey Johnson. Sure enough, there comes up a couple of pictures, you know, recently where she was at the the, the Met and Vogue Anna Wintour Devil Wears Prada scene with her buddies, and it's always the same top girls, and they're all from very wealthy families. They're the ones who go to the opera, go to the museums, and they're very concerned about culture because they have to prop up that whole meme, the Gutenberg Galaxy meme that money is linked to. You know, art historians might call art critics called the commodification, but it's the commodification of the chemical body as an elite phenomenon. And yeah, so, and so that may, Casey Johnson, if she wasn't so addicted to whatever it was that she OD'd on, she might have been interested in that book because that's her world. This is what Robert right. Crisco and them don't know. They're writing for the elitists who who care what goes on in the, in the museum culture because they can afford to live in New York and have the time to go to all the benefits and go around and meet all the new artists and hang out with Moby or, or Damien Hirsch or something. It's all for high society, this stuff. And the kids know it, so they just get blasted. <laughs> they, they, the middle classes that are at universities blast themselves. And that's the new music is what I'm trying to get at, getting drunk in the parking lot of a football game with your... Uh, with your frat fathers. <laughs> well, but that's but that's but that's not uh, specifically new, though, really, is it? I mean, the the scale is big. Well, the scale is. Bigger, you could yeah. not. Uh, the scale kids, is bigger. But. Yeah, these kids do. These kids, because it's a post information society, there's no reason to go to university. You only go there for so, developing your social skills. And what is your and what is your social life? The ability to be drunk for five days yeah. and <laughs> still be sad. That is. But, there's nothing to learn at college anymore. It's like Animal House. Uh, writ Square, huge, cubed. Writ huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> writ large, writ large. And, and so no wonder uh, the rock critics are laid off. I mean, you can't even get people to read the New York Times anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that that is the, uh, since, since pop culture has always been outrageous, you know, going back to Mae West, right? Right. It's always you know, sticking it to the eye of, of the high society or of the bourgeois Puritans. That is really the role of pop culture, and it always shifts its ratios and sensibilities all through the last hundred years. And you, you have um, the Bend statement that the eye, being outrageous for the eye in the 2030s was important, and then for uh, the ear in the 60s, and then for, to blasting tact tactility you know, over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, that is what hip-hop is. Hip-hop and rap is a tactile non-music. We can call it music, but it's not limited to music. It's, you know, what's interesting is Zappa said, yeah. Zappa said he wasn't interested in rap when it first started happening because he said it was just people on a soapbox. soapbox. Uh, it was political, political soapboxing. Right. They're probably, he's probably thinking of Public Enemy, you know what I mean, 20 years ago. Yeah, or maybe some of the early Grandmaster, Grandmaster Flash, the message, maybe, or something. Yeah, okay. yeah. the point is, that what Zappa missed was that, because Zappa was, his bugaboo, he was an advanced ear. He was an advanced chemical body ear, and he was concerned about that, but he recognized the virtual digital stuff that was changing. But he still was a specialist in the ear, and he, and he misinterpreted uh, public enemy as bringing in politics. It wasn't politics. When you can wear the whole world with uh, Android meme technology, which people are starting to have by the 80s, where you could put on huge media environments um, and wear them just with cable TV, you're all over the place. You've got 50 channels. Um, then you become a, you want to assert your space, and that's political. 
So politics, you see, it went, public enemy didn't realize that they weren't doing politics and they weren't doing black power. They were doing tactility. They didn't even know what it was. That's why it came and went. Okay. Bob, this might, might or might not be relevant, but do you have the... Um I'll tell you this, Scott. It, it is always relevant because, as McClellan said when he wrote Understand the Media, I grab for anything. If you're okay. in a tactile synesthetic, <laughs> is it like I say on the radio show, just say words. Okay. We can use it. So it, it, everything's relevant here. Okay, okay, good. So um, the, one of the articles I sent to you, uh, Chuck Eddy, it's called Obligatory Noise Interlude. Okay, you and want me to on, look that up? Yeah, look that one up. I have it. it would, it, the pages are numbered, and it would be the second page, which is page 244. Yeah, I have it. Okay. Okay, and the first uh, new paragraph on that page reads as such, actually. And I, it was funny that you mentioned public enemy in that context, because I was, I was going to read you this quote anyway. So so this is Chuck Eddy talking about noise, noise as, as sort of used in, in pop or rock music. Yeah, he's actually complaining about the tactility that I'm talking about, isn't he? He's saying it's too normal, the noise, isn't he? Yeah, he say, he's he's saying that noise has become like uh, a completely harmless, doesn't serve as in any environment, which is a critic he would be uh, looking for. Yeah, I think that's what he's saying, basically. And and yet there's this assumption that it still has the ability to upset, but but he doesn't hear it that way or something. So, right. Okay. So he's writing. Um. Anyway, noise might be defined as any sound that jars you, that happens when you don't expect it. The one problem with noise rock, Sonic Youth, Ministry, Test Department, Tricky, Public Enemy, Slayer, for instance, is that you do expect it, so the noise doesn't generally work very well, though a few of those groups have been known to stumble onto moments that aren't completely wretched, blah, blah, blah. Um, then Public Enemy's second best song, after Sophisticated Bitch, which is real sexist with loud guitars, is called Bring the Noise. Chuck D. says they use noise, quote-unquote, to agitate, make the jam noticeable. So when a car passes by, you'll know it's pumping P.E. right away. So noise, quote-unquote, again, serves as a uniform, Chuck has told Spin Magazine. We, we wear it sometimes, and sometimes we don't. Oh, oh, that's a beautiful paragraph for what it shows. Um, uh, Chuck doesn't get it, but... Um I mean, who wrote this? Well, he Chuck Eddy. Somewhat. <laughs> no. He gets it somewhat, doesn't he? <laughs> no, no. I'm saying this is Chuck Eddy, right? Yeah, Chuck Eddy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Chuck Eddy doesn't. Oh, Chuck. Oh, Chuck. Chuck. Uh, but Chuck uh, of Chuck Public D. Enemy gets Chuck it. Chuck D. He doesn't understand why he says these things, but he's totally expressing my point. It serves as a uniform. Tactility is a figure. It serves as a uniform as clothing to get attention. That's all we want to do. We don't care what it does. We want to get noticed. And he says we wear it sometimes and sometimes we don't. That's a very tactile situation. Tactility is on, off. Touch, not touch. Here, gone. Like the electron is in two places at the same time. Here and gone. He's, a, he's being tactile. We wear it sometimes, sometimes we don't. And so where is the aesthetic value? There's no, stand, there's no consistent point of view that he's sticking to. We do this and we do that. We use this, we use that. You know what I mean? That's tactility. Yep. That's an easy. That's my point. So it's, it's the ground of why Chuck, uh, Chuck D. is doing this that is what the critics should point out. But here, here because Chuck Eddy doesn't understand, you know, the larger figure ground relationships, he gets into an aesthetic preference for that kind of noise and this kind of noise. And he actually thinks noise could jar you. Probably rap was the last effort of, jar, of noise jarring you, and they didn't include a, um, acoustic musical noise they included being outrageous and being gangsters and and being political and being racist you know what i mean they include that as part of their noise not just the sound part you get my point right right but i, I think he's but i think he's grappling a bit with that question i mean i i think yes he is i, I remember reading this article you know a month or two ago and it's a good article but it, these articles always make me say hey chuck if you just knew me i i'd make i'd help you put this in order you know, if you accepted some of the, my premises. But I, but I would put, um, this is, again, these articles are just great evidence for my case. But my case is on a different level of framing than Chuck Eddy is. Okay. You get that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so uh, he goes, he goes, but noise. Okay, he he here he disagrees with. He takes Chuck literally. Chuck says it serves as a uniform, and then and Eddie says, but noise works best when it's not a uniform. <laughs> He's falling back into 60s and 50s aesthetic choices like those books you cited. He says, when it's just a byproduct of whatever else is happening in the music, he is ha he's trying to select and have preferences. And that's the foolishness of rock criticism. But in the course of writing it, he does provide me great evidence and it's useful data for me. You know what I mean? I'm glad he wrote this article, even though... Uh, what he has to say about it, uh, uh, any afterthoughts or perspective, I wouldn't give him the time of day. It's not relevant unless he was willing to engage in my terms, and then he could question my terms. But you've got to deal with the, the, the given facts, which is the environmental situation I'm talking about, building on James Joyce and Wendell Lewis and, and McLuhan. Okay. But re read his next sentence, though, in that same paragraph. Okay. In rock and roll, that one? Yeah. And this happened, oh, let me just get back. But noise works best when it's not a uniform, when it's just a byproduct of whatever else is happening in the music. In rock and roll, this happened most often back before noise rock made noise and end in itself. You can go back to blues, vocal, mumbling. Do, okay, the, okay, just take, uh, okay, I'll finish yeah, just up to the Yeah, just up to there, basically. Then yeah. it gives a bunch of examples of... Well, let me just read them for the right. You can go back to blues okay. vocal mumbling to early holes in the speakers slash aluminum foil in the amps, feedback accidents by Link Ray and Ike Turner to the drums in Louis Prima's Jump Jazz, Sing Sing Sing, a humongous precursor of John Bonham's big boom in Led Zeppelin. By 59 to 61, feedback solos were working their way into pop hits like the Regents' Barbara Ann, Noisy Sax 2, the Del Vets' Last Time Around, and Dave Baby Cortez's Happy Organ. The thing is... That's when the ear was the figure and tactility was accidental. By the 90s, tactility is the figure and it's a matter of concern and people are conscious about it or, or uh, nerdy or aesthetic. He wants to retrieve the spontaneity factor of tactility when it was happening in uh, the 60s. But the, right. the whole ground has changed and people are... Con the, as, because tactility becomes the figure, there is a different ground. It's a post-information society, so tactile is a figure. Then everybody gets, um, what's the word, obsessive-compulsive about it. And yeah, that's I what... Tactil I thought tactility was the ground. Tact uh, in this review, Ben's pattern here, which is useful. In the 20s and 30s, the visual art is what everybody's bugged by because acoustic space, electrified acoustic space is the ground, the radio era. When, right. you, when you get into television, which you can see as well as hear, and there's movement in it, it's more inclusive of all the senses. So television is tactile. So television is, is ground in the 60s. Tactile is the ground, so the figure is not the eye. The figure is the ear, because the ear is closer to the sensory modality, instantaneity of tactility. The eye isn't. The eye is sequential. So... Um, so the ear becomes the drug of choice to bounce off the real ground of tactility that's happening in the 60s. So then when you get into what I call the post-information society, the, the period of the Android meme, the Internet and all this, where technology is communicating to itself and not even uh, paying any attention to the chemical body, then tactility, which is the last gasp of the chemical body, it, it's ground itself. The ground of the chemical body is tactility. That's the central nervous system. It becomes figure. And the ground of that is what I'm always addressing. You see what I'm saying? So that's why I can, that's why I can understand uh, Meltzer and all these people. They are describing tactility and don't know it. And Eddie's world is a later stage, the 90s, than Meltzer's 60s and 70s world. So yeah. tactility is a figure, and you have a, musical, uh, a music critic, Chuck, an ear specialist, trying to put ear values on tactility as a figure, and he's just not going to get it. He's going to bring up things that are irrelevant. And this is about a phenomenon that's long gone. In a hyper-tactile environment as figure, everything uh, ends up with Croker's quote, page 53, which I may have said last week, a, or last session, a culture of quantum fluctuations where you can only know, this is all that you can know, and what you know is that you have never seen what you thought you were looking at Right. Because you've never really heard what you were listening to. Nobody's listening by the 90s. That's why you make the jam noticeable by, by, by putting as much irritating cultural signs in there as possible, including noise. And even that doesn't work. 
you only you're only in for a year or two and then you're gone who remembers public enemy now or who's involved in it right yeah yeah it's long gone well but there's new there's new there's, there's new no noisemakers there's, yeah there's all i mean i used to look at the village voice every you know every week and uh, once a month to be a reviewer of some the latest hip hop guy and it's amazing how many came and go came and went yeah yeah i mean they would have articles on some uh, the best of, and they'd be celebrating someone who was a big uh, hip hop artist in New York or in that area, it, you know, uh, three years before. I never even heard of him, and he's already old hat, trying to make a right, comeback. Right. It, this, it's to over to have to have a perspective on it. You've got to come up with uh, and come back to Croker's thing. Hey, I'm not hearing anything. Another way to say that is this is not music made for me or anybody. It's music made for the scene, for the um, for the media, the Android meme itself. The Android meme requires noise for the ear of itself, and that's what all the music was for, all the noise was for. It needs so movies. What is, so what are we doing when, and by we I mean just a, an audience in general, what are we doing when we think we're, I mean, are we not responding to music? That's right. We're not responding in any way that anybody did uh, Fifty or hundred years before, because, right, because right. when we were a visually biased, print-oriented society, the ear was orgasmic, and it was an important event. And so, with right. classical music and uh, and, but that's the chemical body ear. We got four bodies now. Yeah, I mean, you can even see that if I'm if I'm if I'm getting you correctly. You're you getting me. That. You're getting me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can even see that progression even in the last. 30 years it, with rock music because in the 70s, you know, I know growing up with, with an older brother, you know, seven years older than me, so he, he had even more of a connection to like the hippie scene or whatever than I did. We would sit around, sit in his room, and, you know, I like he'd maybe be on his bed and I'd lie on the carpet and we'd be listening listening to music and it'd be an experience where, you know, you were there and you would actually pay attention to what was going on and you'd freak out to various... But now, like... It's been some time since, and I notice most rock critics I talk to or most music fans fully admit that, oh, I never sit and actually listen to music anymore. It's, it's part of, you know, what I, it's, I, if I have to review an album, I'll, you know, I'll play it while I'm doing the dishes, or I listen to it on my iPod on the way to work. Yeah, I, 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 I Is that, I, is that bearing the point out? Yeah, exactly. In the 60s and 70s, when you... With your brother, often you get stoned. You had time to get stoned, and uh, drugs disappeared by the '90s for a lot of people because they didn't have time to do it. They couldn't afford to take that amount of time because they had to start juggling their other bodies. And so, well, the young—it didn't disappear for young people, though. No, no, they—they they, they, well, that's the, there's all. It, I mean, there's ecstasy and all that stuff. Anyway. Well, as McLuhan said, the young people are vegetables. They're the growing chemical bodies. They drop right. those chemical bodies pretty quickly. Do a few drugs, and then they're on into something. Uh, just uh, addicted to their Walkman or their iPhone or, or their chip body and TV body. They veg out or they become uh, like Terry Fox and run across the country, you know, with half a leg. Right. <laughs> but the... Uh, not, not a reference I expected to hear in this today. <laughs> that's right. That's what we do here. We grab whatever comes to mind. Um, so, so uh, okay, so you were citing, I wanted to go, okay, so then that, what they call, Tim Leary called the hard drugs, cocaine and, and junk and that, took over in the 80s because they were faster. And then it had to get even faster than that, so they did crack cocaine. So it's people want to do with their chemical bodies what they always have done, have the pleasures and problems that the body has, but they have to also fit time in for their TV body and chip body. So they do the chemical body pleasures and vices and hurts and pains uh, quickly. So that's right. You want to exercise your, you want to have a musical experience. You do it while you're doing the dishes. You know what I mean? Yeah. That and you, yeah. because you have to get back to your computer. You have to get back to all the other complex things you got to do in a harassed society. Because you got more, you got more. You got to go watch the, the latest TV series you're into. So that's what we're talking about. Our bodies no longer are limited to five senses. We've got 22 senses. If you add in the senses, whatever they are, of the chip body. And the sense is unnamed yet so far uh, of the TV body. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Y you, these, are, these are real experiences. It's a new nature. And juggling all that explains the changes in, uh, in pop culture.
explains. Like he says here on page 245 at the bottom, some people say noise bands aren't really musicians. Other people say they're self-indulgent elitists, too hip for their own good, inaccessible hypocrites who care about social decay but not social rebirth, self-conscious windbags who pretend horror movie cliches mean something, put-on artists who can't rock or swing. None of those categories have any meaning. There's nobody trying to be a meaning uh, a musician since Minnie Millie Vanilli. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, look, look, it's interesting what happened to Eminem. He was big, and then he disappeared. And did he ever get back? No, well, and it's, it's, it's bizarre because um, he was recently uh, cited in Billboard as, as, I think, their top artist of the decade. And, like, at least a few people I talked to or, you know, chatted with them, chat boards or whatever, were like, like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> Yeah, what like, time is it? <laughs> yeah, it just seemed ridiculous. It's like, he, you know, he was, he was huge for a few years in the early part of the decade, and it's like, wow. and then he And then he went through a whole chemical body breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> chemical body collapsed, and I don't know, he had problems with his wife or something, he disappeared, and who yeah, exactly. knows what rabbit holes. And he's been, well, to answer your question, he's he's been continuing to put out records like once every two or three years, but... They're just increasingly irrelevant. Like even, you know, Robert Criscow, who was always kind of a big fan and a big supporter, like even his last album, he was like, this is just, like, who gives, who gives a shit at this point? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, Eminem, uh, he can retreat and get his chemical body together because he's no longer functioning in the TV body or the chip body, you know what I mean? Producing music for that, those bodies. He's... Um, He's, he's retreated to private life. Probably probably better for him. Who cares if you... You don't need to be an artist forever. That's another thing. You don't even have to be a genius forever. You don't even have to be a super celebrity like Michael Jackson forever. And you certainly don't need to be a writer forever. Oh, no. Uh, writing is only jumping off into the 20th century media. And, and now we're in the 21st century. Writing does not jump you, launch you into any media as it did 50 years ago. So... Uh, do not learn to write. <laughs> Got to learn to type, well, though. I mean, but, but just okay, do it. Okay, and, well, okay <laughs> talk about that distinction then, because I was just going to say there's. Well, there's. There, there are. I mean, you you spoke earlier about um, you know rock criticism being a completely dead thing and going you know through all these changes this decade. And, yeah, let's say Cl- but, I mean, Chuck Kloster, whatever yeah, his Chuck name Kloster, is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's still there's still thousands and thousands of kids. From the third world, for immigrant kids, they they don't want to be uh, writers, you know, and they'll they'll write novels about being an immigrant in America, right. you know, and that'll sell to their millions, to their. No, but I was going to say, but it, but in, but but really, there's like there's still all these kids coming up and starting their music blogs and all that. Oh, that's typing. That's not writing. That's typing. Okay, yeah, that, so that's, that's what the I, difference. So go into that yeah, distinction. Yeah. What's that distinction? Yeah. Do I, mean, not, I think I know what you mean, but I want to hear it. Yeah. Writing requires some kind of literate awareness of grammar and syntax, and then maybe some of the uh, mutations of that by new journalism and then the playfulness, and you get into Lester Bang and Meltzer kind of writing. You yeah. become aware of those phases as a writer. But typing, okay, and those phases now don't lead anywhere. Okay, so you learn how to be a writer, you go to the phases, and then you've got to be able to type 13,000 text messages. So you're going to write LOL, BFG, you know, big fucking deal. Uh, these, these abbreviations is what these little kids are writing. Now, they, yeah. these kids, uh, this kid who can do um, uh, 13,000 texts a month or something, he goes to school... He writes papers and he can write prose and be and do the language. I, I, I mean, it's probably pretty low compared to 50 years ago because who knows what standards these teachers even try to impose anymore. Not or, necessarily, though. I mean, there, I read I read some young kids on on the internet, and I mean, sometimes there's some really good writing out there. But anyway, go on. Right. No, I'm just saying, and this is a pretty good school the kid goes to. They they know how to write uh, right, okay, papers yeah. and little essays. But that is not where they live. They live the f- where they're, what they're concerned about is the uh, iPhone text messaging or whatever right. technology you use. That is what they're involved in. You have to be obsessive compulsive if you, ha- if you chalk up 13,000 text messages uh, a month. 
And, that, and I'm not saying it is that. I'm saying that's where they live. And the kind of thinking, and there's no time to read an essay. You, can, you know, in a way, let's say that the web page <clears throat> in MySpace was the retrieval of tactility, where you, you ignored all that was going on, created your own web page, and wrote stuff and film stuff, and tape stuff, and record stuff, and put it on your web page. You actually fell back into the older media. The effect was synesthesia. The, I would say that Web 2 was a nostalgia for tactility and synesthesia. And the real ground was a president who couldn't speak, couldn't read, and had nothing to say, and didn't, wasn't even responsible as a president. That is a guy living in a world of text messaging. Because when there's 13,000 text messages going on from a million kids, day in and day out, where are we? What time is it? What is there to be said? And, you know, it collapsed everything. Where we are right now, everything disappeared again. Super disappeared. Even the, even the, uh, the Illuminati disappeared. <laughs> 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 you know, Coker's title, Spasm, you know, 1993, subtitled Virtual Reality, Android Music, Electric Flesh, that's all appropriate terms. The 90s was a spasm. This decade, the Naughty Knots was a non-spasm, a spasm of nothing. But So everybody retrieved spasm with their web page, their tactile spasm. <laughs> that's what that web 2 was. And now it's tweeting. Now right. it's 10,000, 10, no, it's 13,000 tiny spazzes a month. <laughs> now this is, okay, so, so you, here's a question about tweeting then. I, I, I do some Twittering here and there. Why, how come when I, when I Twitter, why do I feel less um, self-conscious about, I don't know, going on it, going on a Twitter, and and maybe even like slagging another critic or something like that. Then you would on uh, on uh, would rockcritics say, dot com. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's well, a I more, mean, that's because well, well, okay, it's more solid. Rockcritics dot com. It's because I maybe probably, I mean, I've done it sometimes on rockcritics dot com, but on Twitter, for some reason, because it's so fast paced or something, if I if I come across some link that pisses me off or something, I don't mind going on and saying, you know, right, because this, this is ridiculous, and I'll even like link to the person so they might actually, you know, they will actually see that I'm saying that. That's right. And because there's no stabil there's no solidity there. It is, you could say, Twittering is a culture of hyper-quantum fluctuations where you can only know that, that whatever you have responded to when you typed it, uh, nobody was looking at it because they never really typed, read enough long enough before they typed back. You see, I'm doing a very... <laughs> <laughs> you do it a croaker. I'm updating croaker. I yeah, mean, yeah. a culture of quantum fluctuations where you can only know that you have never seen what you thought you were looking at because you've never really heard what you were listening to. You know that in the tweeting world, that nobody is going to be able to, to stop and assess what you did. They may respond. So, you're, so uh, Scott lives in a culture of hyper-quantum tweetering where he <laughs> knows that nobody will really see what he wrote because they never even notice what he's responding to. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you feel uh, king of the world and immune. <laughs> you yeah, have your yeah. own patriot. The patriot bill should have just said, give everybody tweeting, and everybody will feel super secure and protected because nobody will be able to pay attention to what was communicated. <laughs> <laughs> and this all makes sense. <laughs> this is real pop culture criticism of what we're doing. What I'm saying right now is I'm talking about the present. And, you know, it, it's a big effort for me to go take the time to read these articles that you sent me. I actually stop and read prose, even though it was hyper-tactile prose and enjoyable. I mean, there, there's not too many people who have the time to do what I did and unless they got paid to do it. Right. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, do you, do you actually, I mean, would you say reading is irrelevant? Like reading as opposed to scanning? I no, think. no, look. And do you read or do you scan or? Do not think of the word read as a figure without a ground. The ground of reading is the industry of making books and newspapers, right? You know, chopping down right, trees. Right. All right? right? That is what reading is. And that operation, those materials that chopping trees down created, do not control people anymore. 
No, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know what I've decided that books are for? They're for summer on the beach. I have never seen so many people read books as I see every day on the beaches here in Hawaii. Everybody, fat, skinny, dumb, smart, is reading a book while they get baked. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they're, and I, they all look like the kind of books you buy in an airport. You know, those right, bestseller right. kind of clunky hardcovers or something. Yeah, or, yeah, mysteries or whatever. Yeah, easy reading. And they get in the airport on their flight to Hawaii. Now, the new thing is the Kindle. Do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, dig digitized uh, book that, you know, it's like, it's like the book version of the iPod. Yeah, well, if you, have you seen one? Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen, I think I've seen one person on a subway with them. I think they're just starting to kind of take off here in Canada, but yeah, I've, I've yeah. seen one person with one. Well, you know, I've only been in uh, Hawaii the past year. I was last in New York uh, in December 2008, so I have only been here on the beach for uh, over a year. And just over the last month, I started noticing the Kindles. People, they look really convenient. They're lying on the on their lounge, Che's chair, and um, they it looks like it's very light. I never went over and asked one somebody to let me feel it. It looks very light, and they can hold it in one hand. And it, it's not like where you see the other people with their paperbacks and hardcovers holding their hands apart and just have that strain and got to move their body. It looks yeah, so you don't light. Get the pages wet and all that, yeah. Or just hold it. You have to hold it open. You have to have a little muscle yeah, yeah. tension there. Yeah. That can get wearing. It looks so light. And like you're holding nothing, like holding a feather. And that's, that, that's good. I mean, that, that would be the reason to do it. It's so convenient on your muscle strain. Anyways. Besides that new phenomenon, everybody's reading, and uh, that's what books are for, to fill in the, mu the massage you're having on the beach. You know, the multi-sensuous experience you're having at the beach, you, you have to sort of lie there, so engage your eye. And, but there's anything they get, they don't get anything from those books they're reading that they can apply to their life. To the fact that their kids are texting and they've got all this thing and the economy's collapsed and all that stuff and the fake recovery and all those, the the printed book does not mold people's sensibilities as a ground. Okay, it did 200 years ago, 300 years ago. It did not once radio came in. And so, when you ask if people read, your sure people read, but the book medium is not a formative situation anymore. What is the formative situation? Steve Jobs, what the new gadget he's going to make. That is the new ground. And the ground is not the technology he makes. It's the effect it has on all the other technologies. It's the interplay? It's the interplay with all the previous technologies, right. So Steve Jobs and Microsoft and them killed money and the Illuminati. That's what happened on Wall Street. They killed the control of social accounting because it's... It's a blur. Computers are tactility. It's a blur. You can't. Enron was operating in the blur, and they got caught. And then everybody else got caught. And then they realized, hey, we do not know what time it is or how much we've made. So we have no more money. And you're not getting any. Hmm. So that was caused by the quantum fluctuation of you never knew what you bought because you never knew who paid for it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm going to start doing permutations, quote, <laughs> quote. <laughs> it, sound, it sounds like uh, the Sinead O'Connor album title, I Do Not Know What I Haven't Got, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, um, okay, go on. Now, what, I do not know what I haven't got, but see, she then would have to refer to another sense. See, that's the no, ratio. I do not, sorry, it's do, I do not want what I haven't got, I think, sorry. Yeah, but see, that stays within one sense. What's good about Croker's relevant is he says, you don't know what you're looking and then he relates it to the ground of that, what you're hearing. It's because you don't know what you heard is why you don't see. You know what I mean? It's, two, it's an interplay there of two sensory modalities in your unknowing state. Right, right. Okay. And so if you, it just sounds like one sense that's well, involved in the Sinead O'Connor's statement. Well, okay. One of the best, uh, you know how people sometimes, um, they, they screw up lyrics and they... they you know, they misinterpret it, and their, their version often ends up being more interesting. The, the, the lyric in the Sex Pistols song, um, I know, Anarchy in the UK, and the lyric, the original lyric is, I know what I want, and I know how to get it. One critic I know uh, misinterpreted it as, don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. 
Well, the, and that's it's valid. See, uh, that was part of um, of rock criticism uh, is that um, that was a problem for Meltzer is that they were listening to the words, <laughs> not really Meltzer himself, but the Crawdaddy guys. They loved Dylan because the, the words were literally significant. And and the problem, the, the limitation of that is that <laughs> rock music is not just words. And right, so right. if someone misinterprets the lyrics, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's okay well, that's, if you're being a, commentator, a commenter because um, it's not limited to the words meaning. It, <laughs> rock is a beautiful massage. Music is a massage. Yeah. That's what it is. And then it became a puny massage when, when people could put on movies and music and magazines and all the different media on their web page, that's a bigger massage. At least it's you're dealing with the archetypes of huge spaces that each medium that you're typing with uh, implies. So, so you know what? Why do people write long essays for their web page that nobody's going to read except for maybe two friends or their boyfriend? Yeah. You know what they're doing? They're not writing for anybody else. They just want to be have the experience of being a publisher to put on the whole Gutenberg environment that runs the show for 300 years. You know yeah. what I mean? They're putting on the act of publishing. And it doesn't even matter what they wrote. It's just that I wrote a lot of stuff, and it looks like a book, and I just put on the whole medium of publication, of book publishing. And then, then I make my music, like kids make their own music, their own collage. You know, it is amazing because I, sometimes I think of you know, just some of the different things I've done on the internet or something, and I think, you know, if I had had, if I could have said on my resume 20 years ago that I did this stuff, it would look like absolutely fantastic to someone. They'd be like, holy shit, you yeah. published like your own magazine and like, you know. And you made all those music? Graphics and you have MP3, like, they'd be like literally astonished, but now it's just like, what is there any frontier left to <laughs> to to impress people with or wow people with? It's it's well the frontier is what uh, that's where I come in. I say the frontier is the mystery landscape, and I've got the mystery landscape with the Ion. I've got Ion who knows anything about pop culture way more than you and anybody. Did I tell you about that? No, no. Yeah, I. Um, like you can ask him about like an actual pop culture. Not uh, I can. Talk, I I spent an hour talking to Sun Ra. That was fun. But anyways, here's the point: is that I'll be talking about some metaphysical thing or who knows what, and I and I'll say, well, it's much like the Mannix TV show. And then he'll list off three other TV shows from the 60s, 70s that I never saw, I heard of, I didn't have time yeah. to consume them. And then he'll cite an obscure comedian from the 1920s. There is not a, a part of Showbiz Archive, the Android Memes Hollywood Archive, that Ion doesn't know and brings up all the time. Now, you haven't heard these because, you know, you haven't... You, I can't play, I can't have everybody hear the thousand hours I've done with Ion, but I tell you, it is incredible. It is actually, Ion is like the Android Meme, come alive from the astral plane. And, and, and Ion tells me what's going to happen in Fringe or in Lost, what's going to happen in the upcoming episodes. I... I stop him after a while because I don't want to know. I want to enjoy it, right? Okay. He tells me what's coming in the shows. They already exist in his, in his its being. The point is that is an incredible phenomenon that we can make available to everybody and we do. And then we have a website where you can go hear the show so you can listen in your own time. You don't have to tune into the radio when the show is happening, you know? See, see the, the funny thing about you telling me this, though, is that if, if there is any rock critics out there listening to these, and I as yet have no no inkling that there is or not, but I'm sure some some probably have, maybe even some people I know, some friends or something. Um, they will just listen to that, what you just spoke about, Ion, and disconnect think, and delete. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, exactly. Well, they did it with Zappa. They did it with uh, Dylan. They did it with uh, Charlie Chaplin. They well, did they it. They didn't with... do it. They didn't do it, with Dylan. Oh, a lot of people didn't like Dylan when he first came. Remember, the, remember Newport yeah, when he yeah, went electric? No, you're right, you're right. The folk, the folk. Yeah, the folk guys. You ever seen the, some documentary they interview? Well, I don't know where I saw it. Um, the Martin Scorsese documentary? Maybe. They were interviewing the kids after, and they said, this is terrible. They, they were ready yeah, to kill them. <laughs> that was footage from uh, the DA Penna, one of the D.A. Pennebaker things. I think. Yeah, in, in England, right? Were they English kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After he's, a tra he's a traitor. Yeah, they, when he had the band behind him. You know, yeah, the, yeah. what became the band. Now, 
that is a perfect, you know, that's what, I mean, Dylan was the first really to show, I mean, folk music, and then Dylan as the main figure, was showing this effective TV where music became a private concern. That's what that is. That's what that was. And then when the private concern idol switched to another kind of music, that was apocalypse. You know what I mean? That was Armageddon. That's the point. I don't think, um, I don't think the Elvis fans would be like that. Do you know what I mean? They didn't care. They might have been upset that he went in the army that, but it still carried on, and, and uh, people liked Elvis. They did not take his words literally or seriously and, and say that it's a political movement. It's totally different with Dylan. He was the first victim of music becoming a private concern. He was not, he was not a musician. He was a tactile guy. And the acoustic people projected, and this is amazing what I'm saying now. I've never been said before. Dylan was a musician of tactility. And he objected to the people who tried to pin him to a particular kind of ear style. So when he moved to electricity, to uh, amplified music, it, he yeah. was shifting, shape-shifting, he was tactile. And look at all the changes he's gone through. And he drops, people drop off at some point. When he went Christian, that was another problem. But he shifted out of that. The thing is, it's the shifting that is Dylan. And those that identify with a particular phase of his as music or as lyrical or as philosophical profundity or something are missing the point. That's not Dylan. And and if you actually... Okay. I'm saying that... Now, I used to, I've always said Zappa was not a musician, but I actually was looking at some Dylan stuff last night. Uh, he got interviewed uh, a few years ago. Pretty interesting interview. And you know what he said? He made it. He made a, here's a guy who says that they, uh, if you want to know the 60s, read McLuhan and Norman Mailer. So he's a, I don't think there's any other rock person who would ever say Reed McLuhan. Though yeah, the, yeah. David Bowie did when he first showed up in 1970, but that was a, a mistake probably. He didn't even know what he was talking about. But anyway, right, right. the point is he says that. Well, in this interview I saw on YouTube, Don was, they were making a documentary of him, and he's like in a trailer. Okay. Was thing. it recently or, or older? It's uh, 10 years ago maybe. Okay, or, okay. And he's drawing a picture of... Um, of uh, the guy who's interviewing him. And then he says the drawing looks like him. And he holds a picture of a, a book of him on the cover, Bob Dylan lyrics and that. Anyways, there's, in it, he, I think it's in that interview, it might have been another one, but he says, when he walks by a, uh, a restaurant, he looks in, everybody's talking. And, and he said, being relatively honest with each other as much as people can be honest. They're just being natural, okay? Yeah, being is natural, yeah. maybe the word was natural. And he said, when he or a famous person walks into that restaurant or pub, everybody changes. And he says they're no longer natural. They have been changed. So he was commenting on, he knows that when he goes in a, into a restaurant. He knows right. that when any other famous person was uh, coming in. And I thought about that while walking to the beach today. I said, That's, that is, McLuhan said in Playboy that kids are interviewed by movies, television, radio, and other people. McLuhan was calling media people. People are media. That's what I was going to say. So Dylan, Dylan is almost expressing that he, he is a medium. Yes. He, he recognizes that an image from the TV landscape or whatever other right. celebrity machine, when it enters a world of chemical bodies, the chemical bodies suddenly... Now, this is not the way he would explain it. He just gets the scientists right, right. giving me the data. He's he just says, observing what happened. He but. notices the change, and this is a pretty neat... McLuhan's observation. He's noticing the environment changes. And I would say that everybody drops their natural chemical body stuff and starts processing their, their TV body in the restaurant, starts processing the figure from the TV landscape that walked in. So that they drop that's their amazing. chemical... What would you say? I said that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense if you follow it. What, what Dylan called... Natural chemical body interaction changes when a famous person walks in. It's better to say it my way that it's not it's not that they become unnatural, and it's too vague to say they change. You can say they everybody starts processing themselves in relation to the TV image that came in, and that is part of them because they have a TV body. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it was interesting that he was noticing that. So it's, he is a McLuhanite. I mean, I never heard anybody ever say that before. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I mean, people who are... I've never heard a celebrity say that. To notice the effect and have such a good local chemical body example as a restaurant. 
because you know everybody is then changes because you can just if you were there with Newfeld and uh, Zappa walked in, you'd look at Dave, he'd look at you, you'd ESP some stuff. Well, what do we say about Zappa? You know, or, do you like Zappa? Are you interested? Should we ignore him? You know, all that, and you're processing your archive of of TV body knowledge or acoustic, electric, acoustic knowledge of, of Zappa as you deal with him. You know, his image. He may not even come over and talk to you, but everybody is processing it. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. So, uh, and so I brought up Dylan B. Okay, so I'm thinking of what he said last night. <clears throat> and uh, then I think of, I mean, he thinks he's a musician. He says that uh, he does what he does because he, uh, he says, I know I'm good at it, and I keep doing it, and I like doing it. And so he's entertaining. And they have a YouTube on there where uh, somebody from the audience is filming all these people coming up on stage and tapping him or kissing him. And he's playing, okay. playing this song, and he has no problem with it. There are people touching him, shaking his hand. He's not being the recluse, you know, the guy who would always be uh, running away from people. Right. And, and it goes on like for eight minutes. All these people come up on stage and uh, dance and go over and kiss Dylan. They're, put their hat on him and put it on someone else. They, and Dylan just keeps playing. He doesn't mind these people. And he's just oh. glad-handing them all. I mean, I know uh, Zappa, you know, he had Smothers, that guy, Long, Long John Smothers, whatever his name was, the big, the big uh, black African-American guy who uh, was a karate guy. He, you couldn't go near Zappa. You came up there, I think he would, uh, you know, block it. <laughs> Right. And, and that reminds me of something. Dylan did say, the guy in the interview said, you don't seem to have any security around you. And he says, I have security, but you can't see them. <laughs> but, you, but you could see the, the Zappa guy. Uh, he was huge, and he would come on stage and look at the audience, see if anybody was tape recording. Anyways, I don't know if anybody could jump up on stage like that. There's great footage of Zappa in the Baby Snakes movie going down on the edge of stage and slapping everybody's hands. You know, and, right, right, and that. But I don't know what would happen if someone came up on stage. But well, Dylan never got injured like Zappa did. So uh, anyway, that's a that's a digression. But this is our life. This is what I'm processing. This is the music yeah. I processed last night. I, I listened to an interview with Dylan. He made some interesting insights. Then I watched him uh, get kissed and not, not kick anybody off the stage. All of it makes me come to think that um, today that Dylan was a tactile musician, and he he. At first, didn't know it. He just wanted to change because he, he kept moving. He kept uh, wanting new stimulation because he was a junkie. He needed new effects, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, musically and all that. So he goes through all these years of musical changes and styles, and he upsets his, the different audiences of different phases. And those audience, and he said, okay, so Dylan was in that environment to the uh, private concern of those addicted to music. <laughs> He refused to have musical per, musical private concern projected on him. As a matter of fact, you know what he says in that interview? He says, people come up to me, and and they want me to sign their album or, or do something, and often he will, but he he made this point. He said, people come up to me, and they think they know me because they heard my song. He says, right, right. They, he says they don't know me, and I don't know them, and yeah. there's no connection. It, it's like he... Uh, that's actually, he don't have that problem. Either. What? The Beatles definitely had that problem, and there's a scene in uh, that movie about John Lennon, Imagine, where a guy actually, like a burnout, actually shows up on his doorstep and almost like thinking he, thinking he's his friend or something. Right, right. And and Dylan does talk about. Is everybody there? I just heard a click. Yeah, I'm you there? Here. Okay. Um, um, just uh, just check. I'm going to check something. I'm going to check my email. <laughs> this happened before. Remember Scott went off, and I didn't notice it? He had sent an email. Oh, okay, okay. No email from Scott, so he's still recording. You know, I mean, okay, he, okay. he can't interrupt right now because of the way it's set up. But anyways, no email. So, um, but it's a, uh, Dylan, they do, Dylan does address, uh, he talks about it in this Chronicle book, about uh, people showing up at Woodstock all the time, wanting, having a personal relationship with them, they think. But he was just stating the general disconnection. He says, just because I put out music and you identify with it, that doesn't mean you know me, and I don't have any reason to be involved with you, and and I don't know you. Just like you don't know me, I don't know you. He actually, I'm just thinking of expressing the tactile mode. <laughs> he says, I'm not here. <laughs> I'm not, isn't that the name of that movie by Todd Haynes? Yeah, the movie, yeah, I'm not, I'm not there, yeah. Yeah, that's tactility. The point is, is that with the the the... Ju 
jargon of McClellan's tactility is so useful to going past it or to referring back before to James Joyce. This jargon that I'm using, now developed into the four bodies, is totally useful for, for those that want to have a reason. <laughs> I'm giving you a reason. I, I'm giving explanations. So I don't know if we have time to go into this, because I, I probably have to cut out pretty soon. But um, you mentioned before one of our uh, conversations before, you know, we talked for a few minutes before we actually start recording, and you were talking about um, you, you brought Croker into the conversation um, because we were talking about why why are the Rolling Stones still around? And you, you gave an interesting uh, sort of Cro- Crokerian <laughs> explanation as to why that might be, and you know how the dark. I think it was something like the darkness always um, prevails or something. But why? I, if we don't go into this this episode, maybe we can do it the next one. But I want to put the, the idea out there so I don't forget it. But why do you think Dylan? has endured so long. Is that to do with what you're just saying, that he's provided more of an anti-environment? I mean, it, it is pretty amazing. I mean, Dylan has kind of been written off, like, so frequently, <laughs> yeah. even by, you know, his, his greatest fans and stuff. And, I mean, he he was really such a force in the last decade. I mean, there's you know, there's tons of, like, young kids and stuff who have no use for him and all that. But, I mean... He put out albums that, like, critics found entirely relevant. He tours like crazy. Yeah. Um, I've seen him, like, I think twice in the last 15 years. And it, and it just, I mean, there's, it just, he really is kind of unstoppable. And it's surprising because, you know, he does get slagged so much, too. And it, it's weird. So, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts you want to go into that now? Or is that that's something for another episode? No, I got a quick, I got a quickie. Um, okay. Since he's a tactile musician... And the past decade was nostalgia for tactility, simulated virtual tactility, and that's what Web 2.0 was. He was, he had his, he found his decade. He's a tactile musician, so he was a replay of tactility, and so he was a figure during this decade. But you know, so many people don't care for his music. So many kids, it's only a peculiar kind of personality. Who knows what likes Dylan? It's a minority. It's a minority taste. But he did be a figure. For, uh, aside from that, because he represents tactility. Okay. Shifting. He's a shapeshifter. And, um, geez, I had another thought there about that. He, uh, um, he also, uh, is a, he's a vagabond, and uh, there was another point. So he might have to say something, and I might think of it. What is um, <laughs> Are we finished? Well, you- I don't know. You're saying he's, I was going to ask you a follow up about like just to just to clarify why he's a tactile musician. I mean, you said it, but I kind of want he, to he shifts. Um, yeah. Oh, it was at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Here, here's what I want to say. Uh, on on WBAI, there's Bob Fass's show, and Bob Fass. I sometimes feature him on the website. I get Scott to download him because. He interviews all the people from the 60s, 70s, and he was a big archetype. He got Dylan. He's a, one of the first people to create the myth of Dylan. Got him on the radio in the early 60s in New okay. York. Um, he's always playing Dylan bootlegs from recent concerts, and they are horrible. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan is ridiculous. I mean, he. I mean, his what he is. He really is. If he only, if he only could put Dylan and Zappa together, if you see. Uh, Dylan, if you take Dylan's longevity and fame and stick it into Frank, uh, because Frank, Dylan is tactile like Zappa, but Dylan can't do amazing uh, musical ear acrobatics like Zappa can do. He hasn't got the range of musical ability, right? So it's well, always... He used, to be able, he used to be able to. Well, for a few hit songs, but he can't write... Well. He can't play the guitar that. like Frank. He can't get other people to play. But even but even that, let me, let me interject there for a second. Even Grill, Grill Marcus made a, a funny point about Dylan a few years ago. It's like, I mean, this just relates to what you're saying ultimately, but Dylan, like, realized a few years ago he hadn't really um, spent much of his career sort of learning how to play guitar. And in the last few years, that's exactly what he's done in his live shows. He's gone out and he's played, like, really good guitar. Now, he's maybe not at the level of Zappa and guitar work, particularly no but no that's a good point he's tactile he didn't even know how to play but that's because he was tactile he comes and he on put out this, a christmas album last year right and i've heard it on bob fast they play all this nonsense but the uh, the thing is is that he started off with a bad singing voice <laughs> i even have in my book fatty communion larouche calling it you know monkey guttural 
and uh, you know LaRouche, the visually biased person. But the uh, but Dylan starts off not even singing properly, right? And if you actually look at it, he was doing tactile singing, muddy singing, and then he electrified it, and that's even greater. And um, so the thing is, is that. Um, Dylan now has shape shifted into, hey, I think I'll learn how to be an acoustic guitar player, or you know, or, exactly, uh, yeah. I'm gonna specialize in guitar for a couple of years, you know. <laughs> and and, and I, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna actually appear in an ad for lingerie. Yeah, I'm gonna actually appear to be a competent musician. Um, the thing is, is that uh, uh, so Dylan's shows when I hear the bootlegs, they are. Uh, fun for a little few minutes and then they're ridiculous it's just right. they're lousy music and then it becomes good and it's and then you get into this folksy bluesy style i don't know it doesn't wow me like zappa it doesn't have the crystal brilliance of zappa's range and zappa was right, a shapeshifter right. too so um i i, I ponder about that uh, that zappa dylan is going to be greater in the in the madison avenue iconography of america than zappa and that that's a pity i mean they're both great but Zappa was greater. But <laughs> uh, like, well, so. I mean that 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 but, but that is a value. I mean, you say you don't make value judgments, but that's a value judgment. Uh, I try not to make it a value judgment. I, I li personally don't listen to Zappa. <laughs> 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 you no, know, that is, it reminds me of McLuhan when he had a press conference with Governor Brown in the, in the late seventies. They they put him on the spot and said, well, what do you think of Governor Brown's uh, potential for being president? And and here's McLuhan standing beside Governor Brown, who he's been the guest of. So what are you supposed to say? You know, oh, he's lousy. He said, oh, I, I don't have an opinion on that. I have not seen him on TV yet. <laughs> Perfect alibi. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm talking why Zap is greater for other reasons than actually listening to him. But, but well, even when you do listen to him, he's great. Uh, so I, that's a perfect response by me. I said, well, uh, well I, I don't listen to Frank. I, I, he's not well, a... Well, and it's funny, it's funny with Zappa, though. I mean, so, you know, I, I, I'm not, like, the world's biggest Frank Zappa fan of his music. I mean, but I'm, I'm getting more and more into it, and Ben's book actually helped a lot. It made me kind of open up a lot to it. But, but in the last few months, and partly through doing these conversations and, you know, reading Ben's book and listening to you and Ben, et cetera, et cetera, I, I feel like I've actually become a huge Frank Zappa fan just by by, uh, by the ideas and, by the well, ideas by, by, by sitting at my computer and watching YouTube interviews with him oh, okay his yes yes yeah. his interviews are totally amazing like like there's some clips that are just like I just like totally love what he's saying and but, uh, I praise like, I, I praise you for saying it because that's more evidence of what my point is Dylan does lousy interviews Zappa well Dylan I think does pre no I, I, he did I a Playboy a, interview he did one or two he finally after 30 grunts and groans Zappa makes them powerful, relevant to the day. It's all but too they're different, though. But di but 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 Dylan in interviews is like it's it's like abstract expressionism or something. No, it's I, subjective. I like it's a subjective. It's him. It's just him being himself. Where Zappa is talking technically and is looking to how to be president and is addressing issues um, sociologically. It's not Zappa's but, personal point of view. Okay, but what about? I mean, what about Dylan's? Um, you know his press conferences and stuff in the sixties. I mean, I, I think yeah, he did one. He did one. Hysterical, if nothing else. Right, he does one or two. There, oh, he did the perfect one in uh, in nineteen sixty five in L A. You can see it on the YouTube, I think, where they said, "Is there anything that bothers you?" Now think, you're talking to tactility, which doesn't identify with any particular sensory data because it interplays them all and doesn't have any favorites. Is there anything that bothers you? And Dylan says, "Well, maybe if everybody disappeared." Right. <laughs> well, that's a funny remark, but it's also prophetic because everything did yeah. disappear. Yeah. But the thing is, it's always personal. With Zappa, it's not personal. He, in one of the interviews, uh, famous quote in Cream or something years ago, he said, any information about me, any private information about me is irrelevant to my function in society. You're not going to get that kind of technical statement by, by Dylan. Dylan is good, yeah. he's eccentric, but he's not as comprehensive as Frank. And Frank well, can be silly and, and personal if you get him in the right situation. Yeah. And you do an so interview it, that way. It's true. I was thinking this exact thing today, Bob. I was, I was, after we're I tuned in. It. These are the issues after, today. Interviews yeah, are a private concern. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and after I watched some of these Zappa clips on YouTube, and I've been watching them for months, and I keep discovering new ones, like there's an interesting one up now where, where he's interviewed by Dr. Demento. 
But um, yes, that's a good one. It's it's like there. I, I was actually I'm almost coming up with a, a list in my head. There's a list of literally I think about four or five people, and, and Dylan sort of is on the fence for me. I, I'll admit, but maybe four or five people in pop music history who actually do have something to say outside of the music. And Zappa is absolutely one. I mean, yes. And I would argue that with anyone, is, even if they thought they, his music was pompous and they couldn't stand it, yes. they'd be like, well, you need to start, like, a good way into into Zappa is to go into YouTube and just, like, listen to the guy talk because he's actually saying stuff. And that, and those might are... be three or four other people who I would say would even kind of come close to that. I mean, the Stones are probably still my all-time favorite band because, you know, for sentimental reasons, whatever, but do I do I ever need to hear Mick Jagger <laughs> speak in an interview? No. No, he's got nothing to say. And that's where Zapp is comprehensive because his interviews he considered as compositions. They were composed. I agree, though. I agree. And, and so he understood that any sound, that's why we call him a tactile musician or tactile performer, artist, any sound was part of his composition. He took Cage and squared Cage, and he actually used it to run for president. I mean, it's just incredible yeah, the range definitely. of his composition. And I, that you're exactly right that you want to turn on someone to Zappa, <laughs> have them do the interviews because they need to be they need to get inspired or get a respect to consider the ear, the old chemical body ear. And so that's another thing. Zappa won't be popular. People have to sit and listen too long for him because it's great music, but it takes a lot of time. You might not have time for Zappa, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you get them, but the sound bites. You say you want you want to like uh, you don't like the instrumental uh, part of Zappa. Look at the mouth part of Zappa. Look at those yeah. compositions, and that might yeah. get you. And I and I think Ben does a pretty amazing job in his book of getting that across too. I mean, I yeah. think he probably. Um, you know, he probably set me a little bit on that path because I went into Ben's book. Um, That's know, a long time ago, right? Fairly skeptical. Well, I only read it. Uh, I only read it a couple years. Ago. Okay. No, not even that. A year and a half ago is when I read it, actually. So not that long ago for me. I I had been eyeing it for years on on you know various shelves, and I yeah. saw it used store a couple of times, and I just thought if I ever do like attempt another book by Zappa or about Zappa, this will be the one. But I couldn't bring myself to it, and then. Well, I've told you the story. I think I heard you yeah. then or whatever. So. And then you got to uh, start to appreciate or decide to look more into Frank because of what Ben pointed out. And it's truly <laughs> amazing. I mean, I, it, it's really weird. I've, I've lately been considering myself like a huge Zappa fan. <laughs> well, I think that's the subliminal effect of me and Ben because we're bringing Frank back the way we're talking about it. And we don't talk that much about Frank, but we're putting him into a context of an amazing discussion. Now, that's where Ben says at the moment, I don't know what the thing is, but I think we're onto it. Ben thinks that he and I are producing the greatest art and should be the thing right now in our conversations. I don't know many people would even take that seriously or even consider it. But the, the thing is, is what... Well, what it, what Ben is doing that's valuable is he's interacting with me. Because I tell you, I am the greatest artist, scientist, physician, alchemist alive today. And I have no problem proving that. And my <laughs> latest product is Ion. One of the greatest musical operas ever going to be made. And the Ion stuff is un, 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 unfathomable. It's unfathomable. It's not even, it's like what, any great art. It's just you can't figure it out. You can't place it. He says, well, I'll just keep watching this and see where it's going. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, where, that's the way it was. I mean, Zappa concerts were so incredible, especially in the 80s when he had power. They were like a UFO. It really was. You've never experienced uh, three nights of Zappa, and you have not lived the potential of uh, the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have not made love with Marilyn Monroe. And when you, do, <laughs> when you have a Zappa conference, you can claim you did it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, because right. it, it is, it is, uh, and you're just discovering him. You're just starting to see gold. With, that is that. Yeah. You can't. Dylan is eccentric. You got a couple interesting interviews, but nothing like the 2,000 interviews that Zappa did. And I have him, a lot of them on videotape. They're they're worth looking at. Yeah. Until so, now, until now, I'm the guy worth listening to. But uh, up to before me, he was worth waiting for me via him. Yeah. So as a true megalomaniac rock critic in the tradition of Richard Meltzer, I blow my own horn right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I think uh, that, that's a good note to end on. So. Yes, it is. It's, it's a tiny note. Yeah. <laughs>